Our next reader is Rachel Volk, and this introduction was written by Paul Bloomer. Ladies and gentlemen, your next reader does not just write well. She coaxes words to do her bidding, or carries them through tormented underbrush, or seduces them in sans serif font, or directs their dervish dance with painted fingernails. Her voice flirts with the line between misogyny and the sacred feminine, while singing love songs to the moon. She moves like the tides and dresses to a tee, even for Thursday night class. It is my pleasure to introduce Rachel Volk. Hello, everyone. I would first like to thank my thesis committee, Judith and Anita, for working with me um, this semester and also the semesters beyond it. I'd like to thank the faculty, both those who I have had classes and also the ones I have had the opportunity to speak with at the studio or in the hallways. I'd also like to thank my family for being here tonight. And well, I'd like to thank everyone also for coming here tonight. Thank you, it means a lot to me and to everyone else. My first is fiction. It's an excerpt from a story called currently Giselle's eyes. What you need to know is Giselle is a fortune teller and she has a sister named Julie who she had a, well, she had a client who looked like Julie earlier who had a similar problem of a pregnancy to go to help her decide on, so. Giselle's eyes. In the closet on the top shelf next to some hats scrap boxes, and dusty knickknacks was a thick red leather album. She took it down, letting the pads of her thumbs caress the worn cover, soft with age and use. Giselle remembered the days, weeks, and months that had been consumed from paging through it, how she had noted every inconsequential detail from the way Julie's skin looked in the warm summer sun to her smile, how her top teeth peeked through her lips. It took unabated, friendly distractions from friends and finally, regularly calling her parents before she could forgive herself for never noticing these details. She returned to the kitchen just when the microwave timer went off. She took out the bowl to set on the table, letting the hot steam rise gently out of reach as she opened the album to tumble down her well of printed memories. Each page had a hodgepodge of photographs from years long past, a time when she was more skin and bones instead of chicken legs and sticks. It started with Giselle holding a small blinking bundle wrapped in a yellow cotton blanket as a proud sister on a blue chair. She had not been looking at the camera. The years flashed forward until they were captured again fishing together. Giselle had been wearing her first bad makeup job of greens and blues while the little bundle had transformed into a sandy-haired girl of four holding up a perch for the camera. Giselle remembered it had just been moments before Julie made the astute observation that Giselle looked like the fish she had caught. Another flash forward had Julie blossom into a budding, pretty tween in a blue dress, borrowed from her sister while looking embarrassed with her first date, who had worn pressed jeans and a Kenny Chesney t-shirt. He had taken her to Olive Garden in the movies. They had dated for two years. Another photograph was from when Giselle had visited from college, both of them leaning against a wooden fence, smiling with their heads tilted to the side towards the camera. Julie's hair had turned a lighter shade of orange in that picture due to the sunlight. Another photograph of Julie had her sitting behind the wheel of a used red car, beaming while she waved to her unseen parents. Her eyes had looked a little greener that day. The snapshots kept jumping forward faster and faster through Julie's life until Giselle came to the middle of the album. The last two photographs had Julie as a teen. One had Julie leaving for homecoming with friends and a flat belly. The next one had Julie at three months pregnant. She still smiled. 
The next page had no photographs, but a newspaper clipping in the middle of the page, giving final gentle words for Julie and Giselle's would-be nephew, Mark telling strangers how Julie had been loved and will be missed, along with her baby that no one had gotten the chance to know. She will not die like you, Giselle said to the album. She caressed the page before picking up her fork and spearing a piece of chicken. It didn't taste quite as good compared to the first time she ate it. She thought that after warning Kelly, she would feel at ease. Instead, her stomach coiled into tight knots. This was a moment when she considered what would have happened if she had never been able to tell fortunes. Would it have made her life any easier to not see the things she did? It led her back to the mixed up gender in the reading. She had had problems with murky fortunes involving the past before since that was involving things that had already come and gone. The past was the equivalent of a worn string that just couldn't hold things together anymore. Unlike the future, the future was more like a strong cable that branched out to hold several things, several strong and likely possibilities. When Giselle looked into the past, she'd have to wait patiently before getting a clear image. The immediate future tended to be the opposite, almost in a rush to show her likeliest future. She felt that itch build between her shoulder blades again. Had she let her own history get in the way? Was Kelly just becoming a surrogate for her sister Julie? Will she actually do it, Giselle thought. Just like that, she was all too aware of the small, traveling ball she kept in the cupboard. She really shouldn't. Not even halfway through her meal, Giselle pushed her dish aside, trying not to run to the cupboard. She removed a blue velvet pouch and poured the small crystal ball into her open palm. It was only slightly bigger than a ping pong ball a pale pink with a milky white film running through its body. It was against the rules her uncle had taught her, against the rules to look at a client after a reading had been done, but she couldn't help it. She didn't care if this led down a slippery slope. Her uncle's admonished warnings of the consequences, fast burnout rates, potential for insanity, paranoia, dependence, were all flying through her head, but she didn't care. Giselle had to know. It was the only thing she could care about. She sat back down at the kitchen table and held her hand out with the crystal perched in the palm of her hand. The pale pink had her full attention with her question in mind. It didn't take long before images of a baby started to appear. The baby looked different this time, incomplete, really more like a poorly put together form of Play-Doh. She felt a huge surge of relief wash over her. It meant that baby never fully formed. She'll do it, Giselle said to the open kitchen. Still, something seemed very wrong. The baby, the baby itself was wrong, something about it. Before Giselle could decipher or what was wrong, the image changed. She saw Kelly sitting alone on a black chair in blue clothes facing a corner. She cradled a Play-Doh doll. Kelly's clothes were quickly becoming stained a red-brown as she leaned against the chair. The source of the red liquid was Kelly's wrist. Giselle saw life fade out of Kelly while she held tight to the rotten doll. It continued to spread, staining everything black. This isn't what I saw before, Giselle thought. What changed for this to happen? Like any acute vision, the answer was quickly presented. She was presented with her own image, a crystal ball hovering around her and Kelly. Giselle was the cause of the change. All right. Next, I have three poems I'm going to read. I would like to dedicate this to Rebecca, who actually, without her help, I would not be going down this road after over two, three years. The first one is titled, Made for a Cross. I want to become tall, like my family, instead of a small sapling waiting to be pruned by a wood chopper. I will stay under the sheltering leaves of my aunt while my cousins, brothers, and sisters grow. Feelers of small insects will explore my innards, 
during the cold frost and keep me warm while I wait to sprout green leaves. How easy to turn lazy in the warm months, willing to bend like the willow instead of standing tall as an oak. Instead, I will try to keep my gaze pointed up, to see the stars when they're at their brightest, to keep me from looking at the false light of candles that would feed on my body. But there are times I have to bend because my neck cannot take the strain. Sometimes it makes me feel that I am already turning gray and dry with age. So I should welcome the ax on my thighs, stomach, and shoulders. I can only stay steady with one thing in my mind. I am still young. Turning my sight back up high, I strain for beyond my aunt's leaves to the moon. I would not have a future as a dormant acorn for a squirrel to pick up with his greedy paws. Instead, I will be a prize for a man to embrace tight while covered in thorns with his head hanging to see the people below. The next one is titled Against the Garden Wall. I sing a sad song to the gibbous moon. She hums the tune back. I can tell because the glowing ring grows with each note. Sing just for me, moon. Give this little night flower a song that her mother cannot teach her. My lips will vibrate a strong alto so my sisters can hear it too. Share with me a melody the jealous sun would never know, one that night moths and owls would want to become a part of. If my sad song moves you to show an unblemished face, would you love me? I sing only for you, moon, on this dark night when you must be so lonely without the stars fawning over your round body. Let me sing you another song in hopes you will love me this night. Let me turn. Oh, and then the uh, final poem is called uh, Behave. <laughs> Behave. Let me turn into a man, as I will never possess the qualities of a lady. Thank you.